We ask all of this in the name of Christ our Savior, who is with thee and the Holy Spirit, one only God. Amen. I invite you to turn uh, with me to the book of Luke this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at Luke 7, verses 1 through 10. Give attention then to God's word and receive it with a believing heart. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Thus far, the reading of God's holy and infallible word. Uh, dear friends, many of us have or have had the privilege of knowing people of great faith. It's one of those things that, that uh, uh, great, how, how do you describe great faith? How do you describe a person of great faith? It's one of those things uh, which is, is intangible. It's something that's rather hard to describe at times, and yet you know the genuine article when you see it. Because you sit with people of great faith, and you're number one, you're humbled. You're humbled as you behold the faith of the person that, uh, in whose presence you are sitting. But it also causes you to wonder, it causes you to question, doesn't it? Uh, what, what is it that makes this person a person of such great faith? Or maybe uh, more aptly, how did this person get to this place? How did this person grow to this level of maturity, this level of trust in reliance upon Christ, such that uh, in, in uh, a world that is beset with storms uh, that can very aptly be compared to stormy seas with uh, great peaks and troughs of experience, you watch them pilot a little rowboat through the ocean, and it's as if, there's no storm at all. It's a remarkable experience, isn't it, to sit with somebody like that? Well, we have an illustration, an example of great faith set before us in our text this morning. And we know that this man is a man of great faith because Jesus himself comments, I have not found such great faith. 
which is a truly rare commendation from Jesus. Uh, we more commonly perhaps think of, of uh, Jesus, and, and maybe we picture ourselves in, in the disciples' shoes as from time to time Jesus rebukes them with a question, O oh, you of little faith. But there are a couple of examples that are given for our edification and for our benefit in the Word of God of great faith. And this man is one of them. And we want to explore then this morning what it is that makes this man's faith great, or what makes this man a man of great faith. And so we're going to be looking at uh, three R's this morning that characterize the centurion's faith. Recognition, response, and reliance. Recognition, response, and reliance. And what we're going to see is that the secret of great faith is this. It humbly rests in Christ and in his authority. That's the secret of great faith. It rests in a great Savior. Well, consider, first of all, the centurion's recognition, the recognition, if you will, that characterizes his faith. We find Jesus in verse 1, having finished uh, saying all this, of course, referring to the sermon that we've been considering in Luke chapter 6. And when he had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he enters into Capernaum. But now Luke's uh, camera shifts to a different perspective, to a different house, to, to a different person. And we are introduced to a centurion servant in verse 2. Uh, and he's not just an ordinary servant. Uh, but he is a servant that is very dear to his master. Uh, here the, the, the phrase, uh, whom his master valued highly, that's somewhat ambiguous. Uh, it could be an emotional value. It could be uh, more of an economical value. He values him because of his qualities and because of his service. Uh, but it appears from the text and the word that is used later in the text to describe this servant that it is the former that there is something very special between the centurion and this servant. So much so that the servant, in some sense, is like a child to this man. But he's sick. And he's about to die. Many of us have been in that exact place, haven't we? As we sit by the bed of a loved one, as we keep that death vigil, as the hope that we have for recovery, uh, recovery of strength, recovery of health begins to fade, and hope fades with it as well. And so we sit and we watch. Here's the centurion. His servant is sick. We're not told what kind of sickness. If you consult the parallel account in Matthew chapter 8, there's a reference made to paralysis. It seems that this man is paralyzed, that he's also in great pain. He's suffering, but the crisis is that he's about to die. And, and this, is, this, this is what happens in these moments, right? There is a, a, a kind of humbling that takes place at the deathbed. Because we have to come face to face with our weakness. The, the death of those that we loved brings us face to face with our utter helplessness, with the actual weakness of our condition. We kid ourselves so often because uh, we, we go where we go, we do what we do, and we do it in our own strength, hardly thinking about it. We face problems, and, and very often our first response when we face a problem is not to go to the Lord, not to lay that problem before the Lord, but to begin to, uh, to use our minds, to begin to use whatever physical abilities and resources are at our disposal in order to address that problem. But death brings a recognition of our weakness. It brings a recognition of the fact that we are, like the psalmist says, like the grass which flourishes today is cut down at noon and withers. That we are here one day and we are gone the next. And so the centurion, consider, uh, 
consider uh, who he is, for example, uh, for a moment. Here's a man that is powerful. He's a man that by his own uh, admission later in the text, he's used to giving orders and those orders being obeyed implicitly. He says, go there to a servant, they go there. He says, do this to a servant, they do that. And he's also a man of great wealth, which appears obvious from the fact that he has largely funded the building of the Jewish synagogue. And, and we know, right, that, that money <laughs> tends to smooth out the bumps in our roads sometimes. Now, that's to say nothing of all of the bumps that money creates. Uh, but, but all of us have probably sat and said, boy, if I had a million dollars right now, what would I do? And, oh, gee, this problem that I'm facing would disappear if I simply had a little bit more cash in my pocket. Well, he's got the cash. He's got the clout. He's a man of power, a man who, who has a, a particular kind of a reputation, uh, some kind of estate in the world. But God in his providence brings this man to the breaking point. He brings this man to realize that he's ultimately impotent, powerless, as he sits at the bed of his beloved servant. So he understands, he recognizes his weakness, but then he hears that Jesus has arrived in Capernaum. And he's heard about Jesus. This is beautiful. We're going to draw this out further as we go. There's, in, in, in Luke's account, the centurion never sets eyes on Jesus. That's beautiful. We're going to see why. But he doesn't even see Jesus. He's not one of Jesus' groupies. He's not part of the crowd that is following Jesus out, uh, into Capernaum after hearing this sermon and seeing the healings that Jesus has accomplished. All that takes place for this man is that he hears about what Jesus is doing. And in his humility, at that point of humility, that point of powerlessness, he hears of Jesus and he says, while I can't do anything about my problem, I know that this man can. And so he sends, he sends a delegation to find Christ. You see, he, he, he has heard of Christ, and he understands that Christ has a power that he does not. This is the centurion's recognition. His powerlessness, Jesus' power. Well, then we see his response. We see that uh, not only does he have the knowledge component of faith, but he also assents to what he knows, or he acts upon what he knows, and he acts upon this by sending this uh, group of Jewish leaders to make an entreaty for him. And notice that in this, he actually becomes the illustration of the parable that Jesus tells at the end of chapter 6. The man who dug down deep and who built his house upon the rock. Because we read that he heard Jesus' teaching, but also that he came to Jesus. Now, this man does not in his own flesh come to Jesus, and the reason why will become more clear as we proceed. But he acts in faith nonetheless. He acts upon the knowledge that he has nonetheless, sending these elders to make an entreaty for him. He sends these leaders, and it's interesting the way in which these elders, as they're called in the text, frame the entreaty. Now, some commentators think that this man had a change of heart from, from verse uh, 3 to verse 10. I don't believe that that's what Luke is intending us to see here. Um, I do not believe that as the elders state the case before Jesus, that they are um, giving or speaking to Jesus in the words that the centurion has give them, given them. There's no evidence that he says, you need to go to Jesus and tell him how worthy I am of his help. But they like this man, which is an interesting relationship in and of itself, right? Because... Uh, the, the, Jew, the relationship between uh, the Jews and uh, Roman dignitaries is one that is tense. 
uh, there, there is a, a, a level of, of dislike at the very least that exists between them. But this man is a man of unique character. He's a man that has uh, seemingly taken uh, 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 or grown in a certain kind of love for the people in whose midst he's serving. So much so that he has built our synagogue, the, the synagogue in Capernaum. And just incidentally, by the way, the foundations of this synagogue are still visible at the synagogue in Capernaum. The foundations that were laid at, likely at this man's expense still exist as a testimony to this man's real, uh, the reality of his existence. But these men, these Jewish leaders, they come to Jesus. But they come with the idea that uh, somebody's worth or, or, or that Jesus' response to a request is based on worth. We do that too, don't we? A lot of times we actually don't rely on somebody else to make our case. <laughs> We make it for ourselves. Lord, help me because I did. Lord, may, help me because I try. Or, or maybe it's not that explicit, right? We just do that reckoning, that, that works kind of treadmill. Uh, we're, we're getting ready to ask God for something big. So maybe sometimes it's, it's so subtle that we actually begin a few days in advance of asking God to kind of clean things up and make sure that everything's neat and tidy. We do our morning devotions faithfully for several days. Uh, we, we try to build up kind of a track record uh, with God so that when we come and, and ask God for something, we think we're standing on some kind of foundation, firm foundation. But a lot of times it looks more like this. We find ourselves in a, in a particular situation like the centurion did. Maybe we have a problem that needs to be addressed and only God can address it. Or maybe we need something from God that we believe only God can give. And our mind casts back as we think about asking God for that thing. And we say, well, how has my record been the last week? The last month? How's my record been in 2021? How's my church attendance been? This is the kind of transaction that takes place in the depths of our heart. And this is the kind of thinking that characterizes these Jewish leaders. So they come to Jesus. Rather than simply making a plea on this man's behalf, Lord, this man's servant is sick, and this man's servant is dear to him, please come and help. They say, well, this man deserves this. He deserves this. But we see something different happening in the centurion's heart, don't we? Because while they make his case in terms of what he's done and the kind of man that he is, he, makes, uh, he, he sends another delegation to meet Jesus on the way to the house. Likely, the, somebody has run ahead and said, they've made your entreaty, it's been favorably received. Jesus is on the way to the house right now. Well, he sends another delegation. He says, stop. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy even that you should come under the roof of my house. Now, some would make the case that this is because he has the sense of, of being a Gentile and, and not being uh, clean and, and not... That, that not being a fitting arrangement for a Jewish man to come under his roof. But I think that there's something far more basic at work here. Uh, assuming that he's a Gentile, and there's not actually evidence that he's a God-fearer, right? The, the, the case that's been made is not actually that he loves God, but he loves our nation. It's not that he's such a faithful and devout, practicing, uh, devout man, but that he's built our synagogue. He gave us a really, really, really good donation. No, what's going on is this man recognizes clearly that there is something that is very distinctive about Jesus. 
And there is something that sets Jesus apart from any other ordinary Jewish man. There is something that sets Jesus apart from mankind generally. And so it is that the very thought of this one coming under his roof causes him to shrink back in unworthiness. And he says, stop. He says, I'm not worthy that you would come to me. I wasn't even worthy to go to you. That's why I sent them. Because I knew that I wasn't even worthy to approach you. Let alone have you come to me. Think about the, the real measure of humility that's here. You see, it's not just the humility of a recognition of inability. But it's a personal kind of humility that he says, I am not enough. And he's a centurion. He's part, or part of the in crowd, right? He's one who would be uh, invited to the various parties and, and uh, those highbrow type of affairs where you import, uh, invite important people. And this man's just a lowly prophet. A rabbi. He says, I'm not worthy. You see, that's the impulse of true faith. In significant measure, our faith is measured by our sense of worthiness or unworthiness before God. And you will not find true faith in a person's life until God has so worked to bring them down from the stoop, the pedestal upon which we all place ourselves, right? Uh, because we're always trying to build each other uh, or build ourselves up in the presence and the esteem of one another. Have you seen what I did? Have you seen what I got? Have you seen how successful I am? Have you seen blah, 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 blah? But when the Holy Spirit enters into the heart of a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, it, the Holy Spirit takes us down off that pedestal. We, we, we begin to throw away this whole reputation-making kind of impulse that we have, and we begin to realize that we're nothing, ultimately. That we are but the creatures of God's hands and rebellious, sinful creatures at that, and that we deserve absolutely no consideration from him whatsoever. So it is with this man. Praise the Lord. Because you understand that it's not something that he's summoning up in him. But actually what's happening is being illustrated in vivid color for us is the work that the Holy Spirit, the sovereign spirit of Christ does in a person's heart. Bringing them to faith. What an incredible, incredible picture he is unworthy neither, er, both to come to Jesus, but also to receive Jesus in his home. So this then is uh, the, the centurion's response. He recognizes first in the first place his need and Jesus' ability. He recognizes in the second place that he is nothing and that he deserves nothing. And that Christ, though Christ appears very humble, meek, lowly, is infinitely greater in power and in worth than is he. But then consider finally, thirdly, the centurion's reliance, the reliance of great faith. Because it is in verse 8 that we see the full flower of this man's faith. What's been happening is it's as if this beautiful flower bud has been presented before us in verse 3. And as we progress through the, the, the passage, that bud is opening under the sweet influence of the sun. And we see the full flower of this man's faith. Because we see that he doesn't just know something about himself and something about Jesus. And he, it's not just simply that he knows and acts upon that. But that there is a kind of confidence in this man that is truly precious. That he's not just admiring Jesus from a distance. But he is, as it were, leaning on or placing himself upon Christ. 
which is exactly, by the way, what our catechism says in question and answer 21 when we are asked this question, what is true faith? Listen to what uh, the catechist says. True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true, that is, I assent to it, all that God has revealed in his word, it is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel. We see that this man's faith, this great faith, is characterized by these three features, knowledge, assent, and trust. Well, consider, first of all, how this reliance is expressed. Uh, the centurion uh, gives this little illustration of how it is that he understands authority. Uh, consider what he says here in, in verse 7. Uh, the second part, he says, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. Say the word. I don't need to bring my servant out to you. I don't need to, to see you with my eyes, nor do I need to see you lay your hands on my servant. What I need, what he needs, what we need is simply for you to speak the word. Well, then he goes on to, to uh, expand upon this. He says, verse 8, For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. You see, he's in a, he's in a uh, delegated position, right? Why is it, let, let's ask this question. What is the connection between authority and power? We know that these words are similar, right? But they are not the same. And there is a connection between them. Why is it, do you suppose, that the servants of this centurion obey his command? Well, it's because they recognize that he's been delegated ultimately by the Roman emperor himself. He's a man... As powerful as he is, his power and his authority are actually drawn from a greater authority that is behind him. And so it is that when his servant hears the command to go, he goes. And when he hears the command to come, he comes. Because there is the clout, there is the power, there is the authority of the Roman emperor behind this man. He expects to be implicitly obeyed, and if you don't obey... Oh boy, it's not going to go well with you. Well, what he's saying is he's saying, Jesus, I behold in you the same kind of authority. Again, he didn't see Jesus, right? There's no, there's no record that he saw Jesus. He wasn't watching Jesus. He wasn't listening to Jesus' teaching. He was simply hearing the reports that were coming back about Jesus. And the reports were... It had this impact upon him that he perceived that there was a heavenly authority behind what Jesus said and did. And this authority, by the way, is far greater than his own, right? Because what authority is it that he believes that this man, uh, or that, that Jesus has? It's authority over sickness. It's authority over the unseen realm. It is authority over the physical creation. He understands that behind Jesus, there is the power of the very one who spoke the world into existence and the one by whom all things are upheld. Now, he wasn't probably trained in, in Jewish thought to, to recognize that uh, at, at a doctrinal level. Uh, but he recognizes this at a gut level, at an instinctive level, that there is a power far greater than any power that he has ever encountered in Jesus. And so it is that he says, you don't need to touch my servant. You don't need to bless my dwelling place with your presence. I don't need to see you. I don't need to have you speak to me directly and have you assure me that you're, everything is going to be okay. All that I need is for you to speak the word, a word. 
and my servant will be healed. That's trust. That's faith. That's faith rested fully upon Jesus. Ultimately, it's not the greatness of his knowledge. He has a very basic knowledge. And it's certainly not his activity that draws forth the desired result. Ultimately, this faith culminates in trust. It culminates in a resting upon Jesus. And as we see, this faith is irresistible to Jesus. For Jesus must comment about it on the one hand, but also the man is granted what it is that he sought. Consider now what what Jesus says. He commends this man for his faith. We read in in verse uh, 9 here, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. Uh, The word could also be translated marveled. He marveled at him. Not that that Jesus was surprised in the sense that Jesus is the the, the Son of God and and Jesus is the one by whose spirit is, is in this man. But he marvels at the way in which this man is set apart from the others. It's interesting because this word is almost exclusively used of people's response to Jesus. Again and again, the disciples and the crowds, they marvel at what Jesus says or what Jesus does. It's only used of Jesus one other time, and that's Mark chapter 6, verse 6, which is Mark's account of Jesus' time in Nazareth. And what was it that Jesus marveled at there? He marveled at the unbelief of the Nazarenes. in both cases, intended to draw our attention to the unique relationship that faith or the lack thereof has to Jesus. There is nothing that delights Jesus so much as faith rested fully in him. Do you know that? What he's looking for isn't your wisdom. He has way more. What he's looking for is not your work. It's never going to be enough to satisfy the the holy demands of his law. What he calls the audience on, on this particular day to, and what he calls us to by the Holy Spirit this morning, is faith in him. There is only one way in which, can I put it this way, you may please Christ. And it is by resting on him and him alone. He doesn't want your sacrifice and he doesn't want your offerings in order to obtain peace with him. He's not looking at your record to see how well you've been performing, what your batting average is, to determine whether or not you are worthy of laying a request before his throne. The qualification is faith. Jesus stops. He notes this faith. He marvels at this faith, and he commends this faith. He turns around, now facing the crowd, the group that is following him, undoubtedly including these Jewish leaders who have come and made the entreaty to him. And he says, this man has great or towering faith. The the term that he uses uh, has this implication, not simply as measuring something in and of itself as, as whether it's large or small, but it's a word of comparison. That is to say, this man's faith stands head and shoulders above anything that I've observed in Israel. Those to whom the covenants of promise have been given, those who have received the oracles of God. And this man, as little as he knows, his faith stands head and shoulders above the rest. That's not to demean biblical study and the study of theology. It's very important. 
That's not to demean the heritage that we have received, those of us who have been raised in the Reformed Church and have many, in many cases, a solid doctrinal training. But know this, that all of that doesn't matter at all in the final analysis. Because if you're not resting on Jesus, you've got nothing. It doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how, how hard you work. You can't please God. You can't appease God. You need to rest on Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying. Then we read, it's fascinating, verse 10, I love this. This is an excellent, uh, amazing literary flourish here. Verse 10, then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. What did Jesus say? <laughs> Luke doesn't even record him saying the word, right? There's something immediate about this. There's something beautiful about what what Luke is doing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit here. This man rested fully upon Jesus and he had what it was that he came seeking. What's the secret of great faith? What's the secret of those dear saints in whose presence we sit and, and who we are so blessed and, and amazed at? It's not that their faith is so large, right? Jesus says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, uh, you can tell this mountain be moved into the sea and it will be moved into the sea. Uh, faith is not like this, this substance, okay? That, that uh, you know, you have two ounces and, and I have like half an ounce and, and you have, uh, that person has like two pounds, The power of faith is its object. It's not that this man believed so hard. It's that he rested on Jesus. That's the secret of great faith. That's the secret that makes the sea uh, uh, calm even when the storms of life are raging. That's the secret to that serenity and that, that quietness of heart that we observe in God's people. It's not in them. It's in Him. You know, everybody here has faith. And some of you have a lot of faith. But the question is, what is your faith in? Because <laughs> we can believe in our 401k. We can believe in our health insurance. We can believe in our doctors, in our hospitals, in our wonderful, amazing knowledge all day long. But it's the day of the storm that puts all of that to the test. And guess what? It's not going to make the sea any calmer for you. But if you're resting in Jesus, you have everything that you need. He's going to take you through. By the power of a word, he can calm that storm and make it disappear. Look to Christ. Dig deep. Build on the same rock that the centurion built on, that the faithful people of God have built on in all ages of the church. Dig deep. Build on God himself. Then you too will be a person of great faith. And you may expect that commendation, well done, thou good and faithful servant, Enter into the joy of your Lord. Rest in Jesus. Amen. O oh Lord, our God, we thank you.
for your word and the way in which your word, though so old, is yet so timely. We thank you for these stories that you have given us, for the the story of this centurion and the way in which we see the work of your spirit in his heart and life. And we ask, O Lord our God, that we would rest upon you and you alone. That we would lean ourselves upon you. That we too may grow to be people of great faith. We ask, Lord, apply this word to every heart. We pray especially for those who do not yet rest in Christ that you would call them, that you would draw them, that you would work in their hearts in the same way that you worked in this man's heart some 2,000 years ago, that you may have the honor and the glory that belongs to you of right. Amen.